<clears throat> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hello. Good evening, everybody. We, uh, we are glad today to have the, the experts and the pioneers of the refractive surgery and the management of the, of the keratoconus, uh, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the all uh, experience in the different fields of the anterior segment surgery, but we are today uh, will emphasize on the part of the intercornial ring segment. Uh, let me to say welcome uh, and, uh, and that we are appreciating the presence of Dr. Suzanne Jacob, the, the director of the Cornea Foundation and the Glaucoma uh, ser Services in the uh, Dr. Agrawal's Eye Hospital, Chennai, India. And she is well known and famous surgeon in the field of the keratoconus of the cornea, the keratoconus management, and also the, the, uh, the, the solutions in the challenging cases of the anterior segment surgery, especially the phacal surgeries and the iris problems and so on. So, so uh, you are so welcome, Dr. Suzanne, with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Also, we have the, the gentleman and the, the, uh, the expert of the intercornal ring instruction and education, Dr. Dr. Leonardo Turchetti from Brazil, the, the clinical director of the Center of Excellence of Ophthalmology. And he is a very good and talent, talented surgeon and teacher as well. Hello, and you are so welcome, Leonardo. Leonardo, I think there is a delay in the voice. And until, until he joins us again, I will let and ask Dr. Susan Jacob to start her, her talk about the intracornial ring, uh, about a great and new innovation in this field. And I know that the, the time is so late. It's beyond the midnight in India. So I will let her to start. Uh, his spe her speech about that. Please, Dr. Susan. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Hossam. Uh, I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Yeah. Okay, are you able to see it now? Yes. Fine. Okay. So, uh, my presentation is on uh, 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 something that I had started uh, a few years back, uh, which I call, which I've given the term as corneal allogenic intrastromal ring segments or CARES. I must say that I have a patent pending for uh, the special trephines devices and processes used to create these segments as well as for the care segments and various types of shaped corneal segments. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. Okay. okay, so now before we uh, go on to this uh, talk, uh, we need to know uh, what is the prevalence of uh, keratoconus. One second, just let me get this out of my view because it's blocking my view. Yeah, what is the prevalence of keratoconus, both spontaneous and surgery induced, I think is something that we all need to do. Uh, no, uh, basically this I have just taken from the web. Uh, uh, from uh, Dr. Randleman uh, has quoted that it is one in 2000 and we know that uh, that's uh, a fairly accepted prevalence. But what we need to know is that's for fairly late stage disease. I think there was a study in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia very recently, uh, which was on pediatric patients and that found an incidence of one in 21. And that really leads us to uh, understand that keratoconus is much more prevalent than we think it to be. There was a study in Netherlands that found one in 375 in the general population. And uh, probably an estimate of one in 200 uh, uh, are patients who have some sign, the kind of subtle or abnormal findings. So uh, this is a really common uh, disease is actually becoming much more common as all of us who are doing cornea and refractive will realize we see more and more patients in our uh, outpatient practices. And so we really need to think of uh, more and more ways about how we can treat these patients and give them the best possible uh, visual results as well as at the same time, of course, stop progression. So now when we talk about the current treatment of keratoconus, uh, we know that uh, progression can often be halted using corneal cross-linking. But cross-linking by itself has a very limited role in regularizing corneal topography and in improving vision. But uh, uh, 
uh, you need to do something also for these patients to improve their vision. And that is as important as just halting progression. Most of the patients uh, will be uh, are, are kind of unhappy with just isolated cross-linking. And so for some time now, uh, keratoconus surgeons have been uh, doing uh, other treatments uh, simultaneous with cross-linking. And one of the very commonly employed treatments is uh, intrastromal corneal ring segments or ICRS in the form of intact scara rings, Ferrara rings, Mayo rings, Bysantis segments. Uh, all of these are available on the market. Uh, one thing that's common to all of these is that they're all artificial segments. They're made of PMMA or plastic. They are effective in improving the quality of vision, but they can be dangerous at the same time. So uh, why, uh, why did I just make this statement? That's because uh, they have been known to be associated with complications. These are uh, pictures from my own patients. I used to do a lot of ICRS uh, previously, but I have stopped uh, since the last uh, maybe four years or so, and I'm doing only purely care since then. Sorry, I'm sorry about that. So you can see uh, the complications are uh, have ranged from uh, migration, overriding of the segments as seen here. Uh, you can have overlying uh, melt of the corneal stroma necrosis. You may have to even uh, explant the segments at some time because of the necrosis or melt. And uh, you can sometimes also have uh, uh, infectious keratitis, which can even lead to the necessity of a penetrating keratoplasty. There's been up to a 30% rate of complications that have been described with synthetic implants in uh, different studies. And uh, this is something that, of course, all of us would like to avoid if possible. Now, here's, uh, <coughs> we have published our paper, we published our first paper uh, on CARES. And subsequently, in 2017, there was this paper about uh, how CARES is likely also to reduce the probability of acute high drop. This was a paper on intacts. Uh, which had been implanted and with time it actually eroded into the anterior chamber <coughs> and caused an acute onset of uh, stromal edema and acute high drops and uh, the conclusion was that uh, probably if you use uh, allogenic segments such as cares it could decrease the uh, complications uh, these kind of possible complications now mm, what is the procedure this is a trifine uh, that i have designed Mm, and I do have a patent pending for this. If you look at it carefully, I'll be showing it to you again, so don't worry. Here is a trefine which has double bladed, uh, two blades, concentric, one within the other. And this gives you uh, this kind of uh, tissue segment, which then later you can utilize as an intracorneal ring segment. So here's how you do it. Uh, I take a donor corneal scleral rim. And then I remove the epithelium completely. I mount it on, a, on an additive antechamber and remove the epithelium of the uh, donor corneal sclera, don, donor sclera, uh, donor cornea completely. And then you uh, remove it from the artificial antechamber and also remove the endothelium completely. So now you have pure stroma, which is devoid of all uh, epithelium and endothelium. And then you use this double bladed trefine and cut it so that you get this uh, ring of stromal tissue. And then you go ahead and cut it further into two halves. These are, I'll just go back to that again. These are cataract uh, instruments which I've basically redesigned or actually just bent out of shape uh, just to get this curve in so that I can easily feed those segments into the uh, uh, laser dissected channels. And just as you do for ICRS, I have dissected out using the femtosecond, uh, a 360 degree uh, channel on the patient's cornea. And I've put two uh, entry incisions. You could also do it with one, which I've done in a couple of cases, but two makes it easier. And uh, one thing that's always asked to me by people who uh, uh, who have seen this technique or who, uh, who know about it is, is it, is it not difficult to ins insert these segments because we're all used to holding that intact or the Ferrara ring or Kerara ring and just pushing it in. But you'll notice that uh, this also goes in very easily as seen here. So you just have to push it in then just lead it forwards or guide it forwards, kind of slide it forwards using a blunt instrument, trim it to the desired length, and then you can go to the other side and pull it into place. So the same thing is done here on the opposite side. So I've got these two segments in now. And then uh, since this was a young patient and also needed cross linking, I've gone ahead and removed the epithelium and, uh, and done uh, corneal cross linking. So here's a post-operative view of a patient. You can see that uh, segment over there, very quiet eye. And uh, you can see two segments. There's one superior and one inferior, and we'll soon have the slit lamp broad. The yeah, that is in the uh, in a broader view. 
and again you can see there's one segment superior one segment inferior that has been placed in a very quiet eye post operative way so here's another patient who's again got two segments one superior and one inferior placed there in the mid periphery so now what are the let's just come to again the disadvantages and advantages of cares uh, as compared to synthetic implants what are the disadvantages of synthetic implants you can have complications as i already mentioned the other thing is that you can implant these synthetic segments only if you have a minimum stromal thickness of 450 microns in the zone of implantation so thinner than that uh, increases the chances of these complications even more so you do not implant even unless you have that amount of thickness to be able to get you 80% uh, thickness uh, with sufficient stroma above it so that you have to implant it at 80% and therefore you cannot implant it in very thin or very steep corneas uh, on the other hand uh, scares are natural implants so it's biocompatible and biointegrable so it avoids all complications it can be implanted in very thin and very steep corneas also obviously because it's allogenic so it does not have problems such as corneal necrosis melt and so on uh so you can implant in very mild cases at the same time you can also implant it in very mild and early cases so you can uh, kind of implant it in the entire spectrum ranging from mild to advanced uh you can implant it more superficial and that's a big advantage because you can get greater effects so unlike intacts which has to be implanted at 80% here you can implant it at 50% or even more if you want to so you can use it that to your advantage and also you can easily implant arc segments up to 360 degrees we know that uh, full full Uh, a big arc uh, lens of uh, synthetic implants are more difficult to implant because it's difficult to push it in from one side to the other but uh, this this uh, icc cares is really easy to implant even if it's 360 degrees so uh, you have a lower risk of complications as i said we've got nomograms now which allow you to put it in all stages of keratoconus and also since you can uh, do it from advanced to mild cases you have a wider pool of patients where this procedure can be used and uh, being a progressive disorder almost all patients of keratoconus do need to undergo treatment uh, unless they have uh, reached an age where progression has stopped and you have also documented progression and the vision is good other than that almost all patients will need treatment so you can have a huge number of indication indicated pins where this can be implanted uh, you can do it simultaneously with cross linking we've also done it in patients who are already cross linked and who are not happy with their vision to be able to improve their vision further and we've also done it in patients with no documented progression again to improve their vision further you could also uh, possibly implant it in other conditions such as keratoglobus pellucid marginal degeneration post plastic dysplasia etc do uh, are uh, we have still not done that because uh, we're still waiting for uh, starting it in these kind of patients uh, we wanted to Uh, first uh, do keratoconus patients you could possibly also do it in post trauma and post surgical again i do not have experience with that as yet uh, cares but i am assuming that it could be used just as you can use intacts in all these conditions uh, you can also use it to treat this is really beautiful and important to know that you can also use it to treat complications that can be associated with synthetic segment implantation such as melts migration extrusion intrusion etc and here you can see a synthetic segment with an overlying melt Uh, as compared to quiet i seen with cares and uh, i'm going to show you the video of how i managed this patient uh, this was the area of melt and let's skip this and come to uh, i've prepared the uh, care segment remove the epithelium remove the endothelium prepare the care segments that's the patient with the melt in prop and you'll notice that the area of melt is always larger than what is seen clinically because there's epithelium uh, just lying there over that segment uh, just pure epithelium if i think i have um one picture which i'd like to show you is yes, that was anti segment oct of that patient and you can see that uh, it's a uh, really completely almost completely exposed segment so coming back to this part of the video where i'm removing the epithelium uh, you can see that that area of melt is actually larger uh, so it's quite uh, big now and uh, obviously this would lead on to complications if you don't remove it so uh this was a patient who had definitely needed explantation and uh, anyway you cannot leave uh, exposed segments there because they are always uh, a risk factor for developing infectious keratitis and a serious loss of vision so uh, what i've done is i measured the uh, length of the care segment that i would need and you can see that all you need to do is just put it in there and i've also put anchoring sutures on either side which are passing through the segment so that it holds it in place in the post operative period and then the second type of suture that i'm using is bridging suture which is is going from side to side and not actually going through the care segment but only over the segment 
holding the segment in place so that again it does not uh, uh, come out in the post operative period now after i put those three bridging sutures i also uh, put glue on the sides because i had access to it but uh, obviously it would not be necessary in all cases if you don't have access to it and then i put a bandaged contact lens on the patient's side so this uh, is the immediate post operative period and you can see how the patient looks and uh, here is a further post operative period this is about 3 months later before suture removal and this is after suture removal and you can see an intact segment on top and a care segment below uh, showing a combination of both the segments and the cares having been used to treat this case of uh, uh, of post intact melt now you can see in the anti segment oct uh, this is how the cares is and you can see it's uh, implanted at 50% depth what it does is uh, it increases the posterior curvature slightly decreases the anterior curvature both of which also lead on to a decrease in uh, myopia of the patient or spherical sphere of the patient here are some of the results uh, if you can see this patient improved from an uncorrected 624 part to 69 part uh, with a decrease of cylinder from minus 2.5 to minus 0.5 and you can see also a lot of change in the trochography uh, decrease in the irregularity and uh, much more regularization of the corneal trochography so what uh, you can see is decrease in regular and irregular astigmatism decrease in the refractive error improvement in uncorrected and descorrected visual acuities improvement in topography aberrations and visual quality you also see a centralization and flattening of the cone and a decrease in the astigmatism uh, spherical equivalent and almost all other parameters on uh, topography uh, here are some other uh, examples you again you can see a decrease uh, in and a, a lot of improvement in the topography in all these slides that you see here and here are again some post operative uh, pictures this is an almost 360 degree uh, segment that has been implanted you can see it going from side to side and here's a 330 degree segment implanted so it's really very easy to just tailor this to uh, your uh, uh, the length that you want unlike uh, in synthetic segments where you have to order them and in you and in and you may not be able to get the exact length of segment that you want because you would in in at least in america you would need Uh, FDA approval for different segments and uh, the different segment lengths and different thicknesses. Some more interesting cases is a five months post operative care patient who's in uncorrected visual acuity improved from twenty sixty part to twenty thirty, uh, which is about uh, six twenty four to six nine, and refraction improved from minus five minus four twenty twenty part to uh, drop down to minus one minus three cylinder. You can see the post operative appearance. A lot of flattening here. Uh, and this is the post op image and this one is a pre op image and that's the difference map uh, some other pictures uh, again this is pre op you can see a lot of cylinder there in the patient he had a minus 5 uh, diopter cylinder 69 this was a child and post operatively the vision improved to uncorrected of 69 and you can see that uh, that the difference map shows uh, a lot of flattening of the cylinder in exactly the opposite axis this was pre op this is a difference map and you can see the overall regularization of the topography uh here's a patient with an asymmetric segment who had again pre op here in the center and post op to the left hand side you can see that differential flattening that has happened with the a single inferior segment alone which again uh, has decreased the uh, amount of uh, protrusion or ectasia inferiorly and uh, all this gives you better visual results this is a patient who's again had asymmetric segment implantation pre operative image post operative image and a decrease and a flattening of the Uh, ectatic area with a, a decrease in uh, uh, sphere of uh, of decrease in diopter power of even up to uh, 14 diopters if you can see here this is day one post op the patient improved tremendously for uncorrected and descorrected visual acuity here i'm going to show you some other interesting uh, cases this was a patient who had a relatively high pre op cylinder and cas was implanted and let me see if i can just zoom this up for you pre operatively the patient was 636 improved an uncorrected of 69 these uncorrected visual acuities uh and uh, you can see that uh, there was a seven diopter cylinder preoperatively uh, which uh, improved or dropped down to a much better tolerated power which was a minus 2 sphere with a minus 2.5 cylinder that was from a preop of minus 0.75 sphere minus 7 cylinder uh, and the best corrected also improved from 612 part to 69 part you can see those segments there and uh, you can also see the pre op topography here post op topography here and the difference map and another thing i want you to note is the differential flattening that we've been able to achieve so you have maximum flattening in the steepest areas and here you can see values up to 7 uh, diopters whereas here is superiorly it's less so that's beautiful because you get greater effect in the in the area of uh, greater flattening the patient was so happy with the visual results in the right eye that uh, uh, she opted to undergo a uh, cares in the left eye as well which had much better uncorrected to start with for 612 part improved to 66 2040 part came to 2020 uncorrected 
and uh, the uh, sphere, sphere and cylinder you can see it was very small refractive error only minus 1 minus 1.2566 but it dropped down further to 0.5.566 and uh, with sharper vision, though uh, 2020 uncorrected was still there, was still achievable with uh, slightly, uh, with slight difficulty. She was able to get a clear vision with uh, just a very small refractive error. Uh, here's the uh, uh, difference in the topography. You can see 51.5 has come down to 49.9, and there's all this differential flattening that's obtained with about two diopters flattening in this area, which exactly corresponds to the steepest area preoperatively. And also, if you can just compare the uh, cares here and the cares in the contralateral eye. You'll see the difference in the uh, in the segment thickness that has been used, which uh, you know kind of lets you know that you can actually tailor uh, your uh, your uh, tailor and get individualized responses to the keratoconus uh, depending on the degree of keratoconus and the size and the thicknesses of the segments that you've used, on, and the arc length as well. So this is nice to know because uh, you can this shows you a case where you can use it from advanced cases to even mild cases and get good results. Here's another patient. This is again an interesting case who was a young girl from another city who came for treatment. Uh, she was at 560, 5 by 60 or 250 uncorrected uh, to start with, improved postoperatively to 66 part, again uncorrected, uh, 2020 part. Uh, and you can see that flattening in the topography which she achieved here. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is her uh, uh, sit lamp image. Uh, this uh, she uh, had come from another city, as I mentioned, and she did not have she could not afford uh, a treatment for both the eyes. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened right there. Uh, yeah, she could not afford the treatment in both the eyes at the same time. So uh, therefore, uh, she went back uh, and she came back a year later, uh, wanting treatment in the left eye as well. And when she came back a year later, we, this was a uh, topographic image. You can see that the right eye had a lot of uh, flattening, uh, even though, uh, you know, preoperatively she improved from minus 1.5, minus 2.5 cylinder, she came to a plano 66. In the left eye, which was purely only cross-linked at the time. So we had not done the cares, but we had done a pure cross-linking. And one year later, you can see the difference in the topography. There's hardly any difference in the topographic map, even though she had achieved stability in terms of non-progression. There was no uh, actual difference in terms of uh, uh, topographic improvement. And that's the reason she came back, because she was uh, still at an uncorrected of 660 uh, post-cross-linking, and whereas she had improved to 66 uh, post uh, post uh, cares with cross-linking. So she obviously came back a year later uh, for treatment and this is again just a repetition of that uh, post one year uh, topographic map of pre and post cross-linking where there was no image, no difference in the topography. We did a uh, cares in, in this cross-linked eye and again you can see uh, we are able to achieve a, a, a narrowing of that area of ectasia, a decrease in all the values flattening again differential with maximum effect in the area of uh, protrusion and you can see those segments they were lying very quiet and she improved from uh, 660 to an uncorrected of 618 and with a decrease in sphere and cylinder as well. Uh, just a couple of more patients I don't know if I have time Dr. Hussam. Okay uh, this is a patient again uh, uh, who underwent only in one eye. Uh, so this eye, the eye, eye that he underwent, you can see that there was a lot of improvement again from uh, minus uh, from four by sixty he came, improved to six twenty four, and from uh, minus five minus five point five sphere he improved to a minus three minus three point five sphere. On the other I also, uh, sorry, this is a patient with bilateral cares. I'm sorry, this, this, let me just zoom this down. It's a little confusing for me also. I zoomed up. Uh, yeah, this is a patient I wanted you to see. You can see that this patient has got uh, 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 advanced keratoconus in, in both the eyes, but there was anisometropia. It was an interesting case because uh, he had a 5.5 with 3.5 cylinder, 612 in the left eye, and uh, he had 10 with 3 cylinder in the left eye, in the right eye. So we implanted a cast and we brought it down to minus 5, minus 2 in the right eye as well. And that resolved the anisoconia. So we just did a plain cross-linking for the left eye, and he was very happy with his results. He also had affordability problems. That was part of the reason why we did not uh, uh, do the uh, do the uh, cares in the in both the eyes. But uh, this was another patient where we got very good results. Uh, so again, we have had very good results in uh, in in all these patients. Uh, 
uh, here's another example of a lot of flattening uh, of the keratoconus and uh, that patient had improved from pre-op 612 to 66 with a decrease in sphere and cylinder as you can see here i can go on showing you examples i'll just come to the end of my presentation however this is a patient uh, post keratoconus and cares uh, where, where you can see the implantation of the segments which is at 50 percent and a very good uh, quiet uh, uh, looking anti-segment oct with no uh, inflammation or any other kind of uh, reaction that's seen around the segment. These are the light microscopic images again seen here, uh, which show you uh, the very uh, parallel and well organized uh, structure of that KS segment with the uh, good organization of the corneal uh, fibers. So we've had uh, this, this uh, published in Journal of Refractive Surgery, which was our first uh, case report of about 120 patients. I mean, of 24, I think 20. 24 eyes, yes, 24 eyes, where we found improvement in all parameters. We are now at about 130 to 150 eyes, I think we are at now. So we've done uh, much more cases now. Uh, this was published on the cover page of uh, JRS uh, to conclude. What are the advantages once more? This is uh, the use of allogenic tissue. So there are no disadvantages of synthetic. So you get more biocompatibility, good corneal integration, less complications uh, such as new vascularization, stromal melt, migration, extrusion, etc. It's easily available, easy to perform using a pull-through technique. And it's uh, uh, at more economical uh, depending on the country where you are in. So for us, uh, our corneal tissue does not cost much, so it's much more economical. When, and uh, you could possibly do it in uh, your country as well, uh, depending on the cost. Ease, uh, it's easy, it's effective, it's stable, it's simple, safe, it's reversible, it's adjustable, and it has a very low level of rejection. Uh, if you ask me why, uh, this is a question again, which I'm always asked, what about rejection? Can that happen? Uh, uh, and what I say to this is that you have to remember that uh, CARES uh, is allogenic tissue. Uh, it's implanted in the mid periphery. There's a very small amount of tissue that's implanted. Uh, in DALP, we've removed the epithelium. I mean, here in CARES, we've removed the epithelium and the endothelium, which are the more antigenic layers. So you're implanting only pure stroma. We know that in DALC itself, when we do that for keratoconus, uh, we have uh, we have actually uh, uh, very uh, much larger amount of uh, tissue that's been implanted. I was actually looking for another slide which explains this beautifully, but I can't find it now. Uh, but we have a large amount of tissue implanted in DALC. In contrast to that, the amount of tissue that's implanted in CARES is so small that they, even with DALC, your risk of rejection is so low that we many people stop steroids in three months. I continue for six months, but there are doctors, there are final surgeons who stop in three months. In, with CARES, we continue steroids only one and a half months at very low levels, which is equivalent to post cataract surgery, and we've not had any problems so far. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason, the reason would also be because you get keratocyte repopulation from all sides very rapidly. So unlike DALC, where you have to slowly get keratocyte repopulation from all the sides, here it's within the corneal tissue, it's enclosed by the host, by the host trauma on all sides, so you can get very rapid uh, repopulation. And also, uh, uh, it's away from the limbus, so there are no sutures, and for all these reasons, the level of rejection is very low. You're not seeing any. And, and just to look at the worst case scenario, even if you have uh, rejection, there's really nothing that happens because this is the mid periphery away from the visual axis. So the patient uh, still continues to do well. Um, I think uh, there's probably just this one slide which I missed, uh, which I'd like to show you. This is a patient in very advanced uh, 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 keratoconus 72 diopters of uh, steepening. I've done it up to 80 diopters now, where we got a lot of flattening and uh, we could do away with the DALC. We did cares with cross-linking, so you can avoid corneal procedures. In such patients, here's a patient where you see about 20 diopters of flattening. So again, uh, these, these cases are really good. This procedure is really good and I've avoided DALC in many cases now and just done cares and cross-linking and have got very good results. I think with that, I'll end my talk. Uh, Dr. Hassan, thank you so much for having invited me here. And uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, now we have to thank you uh, because uh, yeah, your, your time uh, and, and I, I think you have a cold now. Uh, <laughs> yes, so, slightly. <laughs> so, I appreciate, so I appreciate your presence and your participation. I'm not used to staying awake so late in the night. So. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Dr. Susan Jekyll, for this uh, great okay. and informative, highly informative uh, presentation about this uh, innovation, which is um, uh, recent which is somewhat 
from yeah, it, it's from three years, but still like recent right uh, uh, innovations in the field of the cryocurrents management and the uh, uh, intracranial uh, uh, inlays or implantations. But my question uh, to you: uh, Do you think that the the uh, the aim of the uh, intracranial ring segment implantation, the cornea, just implantation of uh, of adding of tissue adding? Uh, uh, in other way, I can ask you this question. This is the the principle of the intracranial ring is adding something inside the cornea, or to add. A, a material who can stretch the cornea. Yeah. So uh, uh, with with cares, uh, what we do is we add tissue into the. So it's an additive procedure. You're adding tissue into the uh, cornea, and that by itself causes regularization. So uh, you don't, uh, unlike plastic, where uh, it's, it's supposed to give a stretch as well. We don't know if cares is also having that effect of giving stretch, but definitely it's adding tissue. And just by the property of that extra tissue that's added, it regularizes the topography. Now that you can, it's a very simple way to understand. For example, if you have uh, got, uh, uh, let's say, a smile, you're doing a smile surgery, refractive surgery, and got, you've got a partially extracted lenticule. Even with those very, very thin lenticules, you still, if you look at the topography, you see that that area of the lenticule is different topographically. Yes. So you can, you know, when you're putting in so much of tissue, you can get a lot of uh, regularization. And then obviously, if you have got a very ectatic cornea to start with, and if you have regularized the topography by adding the cares, yeah. so what happens is that all the biomechanical stress that was initially, you know, going only at the area of ectasia is more uniformly distributed around. So that is, of course, also the mechanism that has been proposed in synthetic ICRS, and that would also apply for cares, which, uh, which you know, would, would probably help in uh, delaying progression to some extent, but of course, not as much as a cross-linking would be. So the definitive treatment for delaying progression would still be cross-linking, but probably cares will also have some kind of a synergistic effect with, as ICRS also has, synthetic ICRS also has. Yes. So, so thing, yeah. Another thing I'd like to say is that CARES is now uh, being done in many places around the world uh, by uh, at least three or four doctors in US and in many other countries, South Africa and lots of other countries now, uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, uh, I, I, I cannot remember all the countries, but yes, it's being uh, adopted now in many countries. I'm happy to say that and I'm happy to see that. So it is slowly becoming more popular. It's been about four to five years since we did it. Of course, initially we went slow because we wanted to see how, how patients do with it. And then when we became more confident of our results, and of course, when we started out, you know, it, it was a process in evolution. So it was not as easy as it looks now. We also tried to play around and see which way the procedure works best, uh, which way it is easiest to implant. And we finally came to this uh, technique where uh, we could make it really easy to implant. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, uh, the the main the, the the main or the aim of, of putting something inside the cornea is try the trial to re regularization of this cornea, not not only stretch of this stretching of this cornea. Uh, am I right? Yeah. As I said, yeah. we don't know if it if it stretches. I really don't know because for that you would have to do math. Um, you would probably have to do some finite element analysis and things like that. You know, to be, you do some computerized uh, uh, analysis to do that. It may still have a stretching effect because you are putting something there. When you put something there, there's always a stretching. Whenever you put something into the cornea, it's possible that there's always stretching also happening. So yeah, okay. it's possibly stretching as well as adding tissue. Okay. I'm asking this question because I, all the time I was thinking about the intracranial brain segments that it is, uh, 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 it's a, a tough, hard material put inside the cornea under some pressure with the same circumference of the cornea. So when uh, when it's put it's implanted inside the cornea, it will get some flattening of the of, of the whole cornea, not this part of the cornea. So, uh, and this is the second question. So I was advised by many uh, of my professors and colleagues to wait for, uh, some time after implantation of the ICR to to do cross linking. So you will get uh, uh, more. Uh, a, a more, more improvement or more flattening of the cone, uh, and and will will get more effect of the intracranial ring implantation after three weeks from uh, the the, uh, the the first session to do cross linking after that. So you you, you have shown a simultaneous implantation of the cares with the cross linking. Yeah, I think that, that would probably depend a lot on uh, your personal preference because when I used to do ICRS also, I used to do simultaneously. I don't uh, 
uh, really, you know, like to take the patient back multiple times to the theater. So I think that would be a personal preference uh, from doctor to doctor. You could do it simultaneously with care. Also, if you prefer to, you could leave a gap of maybe a week and then do it. Or if you want, you know, wait for longer and do it. But uh, I, I have always kind of preferred to do procedures simultaneously. Uh, and, and that was basically the principle for me doing together. If you prefer to do it uh, at, at multiple sittings, you could possibly do it that way as well. Okay, thank you for, for uh, this explanation and uh, uh, this push in the way of, uh, of thinking about the, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, ch the challenging uh, situation and how to find the different solutions and alternatives in treatment of, of the same uh, disease. Actually, it is superb work. It's an amazing work and so beneficial, especially in the centers where there is a smile, uh, the smile device, where, where is a lot of the lenticules. So we have, a, we, had, we, we have a question here from Dr. Hen. She's asking you about the, the smile lenticule. Can we prepare this, this part for cares from the lenticule itself, not from the, the donor cornea? Uh, not from the donor cornea and from the lenticule. Uh, I think lenticules are mm, uh, are much thinner than what we put because here I'm putting almost full thickness of the cornea from, you know, I get the entire thickness. So uh, lenticules are not going to give you that amount of thickness. Also, it would be very difficult to accurately cut the lenticule so much. So what you could possibly do is a lenticule is uh, implant it fully into the, uh, make a lamellar cut and then implant it into the keratoconus eye. That's what has been done and tried in keratoconus patients with smile lenticules. That's very different from CARES because yes. CARES is more like ICRS where you're actually putting yeah. donor stromal tissue into the periphery. However, uh, I have tried uh, putting smile lenticule in the, over, you know, in the, in the, this thing and I've seen that it actually causes a further steepening in the center for the patient. And I was not, I did not really like that. And so I stopped doing it. Plus you have multiple interfaces over the visual axis. So you have two interfaces on either side of the lenticule, which can again degrade visual quality. So for all these reasons, I, uh, I was not too happy with that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Susan. Uh, the the last question for you about the the my ring. I think you 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 remember the my ring. It's not uh, more popular now, but you didn't think I will give I will get you an idea today. Uh, um, it, it didn't didn't think before about the the same concept of the my ring to to make a pocket and and put a plate of the uh, of the uh, of the corneal tissue inside the this pocket uh, as if it's my ring or as if it's add. In the center of the cornea, instead yeah. of instead of segments. Uh, yeah, that's that's partly what has been done. Uh, you're talking about whether you can put an entire tissue there, right? Yeah. Over the uh, lamellar lamellar tissue. In the ultra thin cornea, we can we can increase its thickness and its power yes. by, by adding of this. You you can it and it has been tried also, but as I said, you get multiple interfaces if you're over the visual axis, and you also. Uh, uh, cause a more steepening unless your profile of the implanted tissue is very accurate. So uh, that that is one disadvantage which uh, doesn't uh, which uh, uh, cares doesn't have. You could possibly implant cares just like a myo ring where you cut it fully and don't uh, cut it into. I mean, after making the care segment, you don't cut it and you make a lamellar uh, cut and you just put it like a myo ring on. Uh, uh, you know, so that's completely circular. But I have put 360 degree cares even without that lamella cut. So. Uh, however, you know, vertical cuts in the cornea, we know that vertical cuts in the cornea weaken the cornea more than uh, lamellar uh, or horizontal cuts. But still, in a keratoconus patient, as far as possible, you would want to avoid even lamella cuts. So I, I wouldn't like to do that. Instead, if I can do the same, get the same 360 degree effect of the myoring by going through the channel itself. So I can implant a full 360 degree uh, care segment and I've done it. Through, a, through the channel without having to create that lamellar ring, which is impossible practically with the uh, synthetic segments. You would, you would have to have a lamellar channel with synthetic segments. Uh, okay, but, but as an allogenic graft, uh, in your practice, uh, uh, how many cases you, 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 you faced uh, the rejection with that? That's what I said. Rejection, we, we, I'm giving a very low quantity of low dose of steroids. Uh, I give it... Uh, at about six times a day, uh, antibiotic with dexamethasone uh, combination for about uh, three weeks. Uh, and then I drop down to four and then two. Uh, and by six weeks, I'm done. 
I, I, I don't give any more steroids at all. Uh, post that, if the patient uh, wants something, you know, I add some more tear supplements for some more time and that's it. That's it. That's all my treatment lasts for. So the risk of rejection is really low. As I said, the amount of tissue, the quantity of tissue that's being transplanted is really low. And even with DALC, if you can stop steroids after three months, then with this, you should definitely be able to stop much earlier. Uh, the risk of rejection is very low uh, because of all the multiple reasons that I said earlier. There's no epithelium. There's no endothelium. It's pure stroma. Volume of tissue transplanted is very low. It is surrounded by host stroma on all sides. So keratocyte repopulation by the host stroma is really, really fast. It's away from the limbus. There are no sutures, um, you know, and, uh, and uh, uh, for all these reasons, there are no vascularization incited. The risk of rejection is much, much lower. And I haven't had any rejections. And even if it rejects, you know, you get, uh, you get uh, nothing, nothing happens because the tissue will still be there. It still give you the topographic regularization and it's out of the visual axis it's in the mid periphery. So you would not have any effect on vision degradation, unlike in a dial where in the worst case scenario, if you get a, uh, you know, rejection, then you can have is effects on vision. Here, that would not happen. Yes, okay, that's great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Susan, for this uh, 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 a very, very amazing work and, and super trials uh, to, uh, to correct the, that cornea from the, the available materials. When we miss the intercornea ring segments, which is the the acrylic and may be uh, defective in some parts in the, in, the, in the bird, we can find the solution by Dr. Susan now. Uh, so uh, before going to the, the presentation of Dr. Leonardo, uh, Dr. Leonardo Turchetti, um, I, think, I think he has some question on some comments to you. Yes, yeah, sure. Dr. Leonardo, we, we, missed, we missed you when, uh, on introduction, uh, so I will introduce you again, uh, Dr. Leonardo Turchetti from Brazil. He is one of the international uh, uh, cornea uh, and the keratin cornea uh, surgeons uh, and one of the instructors, uh, famous instructors about the intercornea ring segments everywhere, especially in the iscris, I think from a long time. Uh, and he has a very good uh, surgeon and talented teacher and he's my close friend. So Leonardo, you can, uh, you can uh, ask your question now. First of all, Hassan, thank you very much for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you. My pleasure. Uh, I miss you here in Brazil last month. You are supposed to be here with us um, in our national meeting, but it was canceled. Yeah. I'd like to retribute all your kindness I re have received from you in Cairo on January, but we have it in, in the future for sure. We received you here. With pleasure, my friend. We, we missed also uh, Dr. Susan. I invited her, but she, she was so busy. And yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had a very good luck when I have met her in, uh, in Dr. Agrawal's hospital in India and spent a, a, a very good and long time with her, uh, learning from her a lot of things. It was, uh, it was lovely great. to have you there, Hussam. It was uh, Dr. Hussam. It was lovely to have you here with us. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, then in order, okay. yeah, give, give us your comments. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, uh, congratulations, Susan. Uh, brilliant job, excellent technique, uh, amazing, amazing. Uh, I'd like just to make some, some questions and comments um, about the, uh, the long-term follow-up of these patients because uh, there is a, a collagen turnover, especially in patients uh, with cartoconus, uh, which usually had an increased activity of metalloprotein acids. So I wonder if this tissue uh, cannot be degraded over, ta over time. So I'd like to know about uh, long-term results of this technique. I think that's a good question. We've seen that it does not happen. It actually remains in place. And uh, we've got about, uh, I think now, uh, about four plus years uh, of uh, follow-up. Uh, of course, initially the number of cases was lesser, but uh, over the last, I think, two, two and a half years, our number of cases has gone up much, much more. Uh, and uh, no, we have not seen that problem. Patients remain, uh, uh, you know, uh, the segments remain intact. They remain well. Uh, and also we are now uh, trying to get our data together, actually, to, for a publication on these, on all these aspects as to how the segment behaves over time and all that. Uh, topographically, we've seen that they remain stable, but of course, in all the patients who do need cross-linking, we always combine with cross-linking. We don't rely on just this alone. 
so we've not uh, and also of course i also uh, do uh, dr hosam might be knowing about it my technique of contact lens assisted collagen cross linking for the very thin corneas so even the very thin corneas where i've put in cares even the ones who had 82 diopters 80 diopters of steepening i always combine it with a cacxl contact lens lens assisted cross linking so that there was the added uh, assurance that cross linking is working and uh, you know it's not going to it's going to prevent progression as well help prevent progression as well okay good uh, another comment. Um, don't you think that as probably you don't have uh, halos and glare issues because it's, a, it's not a syntactic uh, tissue, uh, could we implant in a smaller optical zone to achieve yes. uh, even better result? Yes. Might, maybe six or even five? Now I've gone to 5.3, 5.4. Uh, I have friends international who have gone to five, as you said. And they were very happy with the results because they got a huge dramatic improvement in the spherical equivalent as well, as you said. And uh, yes, uh, that, that's one thing which I forgot to mention in my presentation. Halo and glass becomes much less of a problem since it's allogenic tissue. So that's, that's definitely another advantage. Something else that you, when you just mentioned this that I remembered about was because this topic of point of halo and glass was actually given to me by one of my international uh, friends, you know. Uh, um, uh, about, uh, you know, that this possibility that this is going to be less in these patients. And that's when I actually started looking for it and found that, yes, it was less. The other thing uh, another friend had suggested to me was uh, the use of it as a lasso suture in uh, post-RK patients, you know, like a green lasso uh, in post-radial keratotomy patients. I haven't tried this. I, I, I have to tell you that. But these are other possibilities that people uh, have, uh, you know, uh, mentioned uh, using these using these segments. Excellent. Congratulations, Susan. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, uh, uh, before going to your presentation, Leonardo, <clears throat> I will ask Susan uh, uh, three uh, questions from the audience. They are asking about the, the nomogram. It's a very good question about that because we are following the nomogram in the synthetic intracranial ring segments. Yeah. Uh, because it's a, a, a tough, hard material, so the thickness yeah. will be different and so. There is so a the nomogram for that. The principles of the nomogram are actually similar to that of uh, ICRS. Uh, you want to uh, change, you can uh, you know, play around with the optic zone, you can uh, play around with the arc length and the thickness that's implanted. And another additional thing that you get here is the, super, the, uh, the depth of implantation. But I keep the depth of implantation as standard 50%. I don't change that. 50% of the thinnest location in the optical zone uh, of implantation, uh, in, the, in the zone of implantation, I'm sorry. Uh, and 50%, 50% at the zone, the 50% thinnest pachymetry in the zone of implantation. Yeah. Uh, about the um, uh, optic zone, as I said, the closer you come, the more effect you get. And also, uh, if when you decrease the arc length, you get a more effect on the uh, astigmatism uh, rather than on the sphere. So you can actually uh, use all of these and do it. Uh, we've got trephines. These trephines are manufactured in India. And uh, if anybody would like to uh, get more information about this, please email me. I, my email is there on all my YouTube videos in the very opening front side. So you can just get it from there and email me if you're interested in starting this off. And I'll help you with the uh, nomograms with, what, with the trephines that are available and help you in uh, acquiring those trephines as well. Um, yeah. Uh, the nomograms, yes, we have, uh, we have, we have, uh, we have uh, kind of getting them in a very good place because we are getting very good results. Even previously, uh, you know, the, the uh, one thing that I find about ICRS is that the very uh, fact that you can do this always gives you regularization. Now it's just fine tuning that matters, and we are able to get that fine tuning now with the nomograms. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You 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 have already uh, answered the second question about the refine. Uh, so, if anybody uh, needs any information about the tree fine and the, the nomogram, he, uh, he can email Dr. Susan Jacob and she will help in that. Right? Uh, another question can you do this technique in the PMD, illicit marginal degeneration? Uh, uh, I haven't done it personally, but I'm assuming that you could uh, also do it. Uh, the advantage here is that. Uh, is that, uh, uh, you know, unlike intacts where PMD can sometimes become very thin intro interiorly, uh, you could still, you know, have put this in and not have any uh, problems associated with corneal melts. Now, I, I, I haven't really done it to be able to comment on it, but I'm assuming that, yes, you would be able to. Uh, Maybe Dr. Tokety has uh, 
experience with GATS or Kera rings or with for uh, PMD and he could give his thoughts about how these would do? Okay, the second question, can you do another uh, procedures uh, together with this, with this technique like the uh, clearance extraction, FACO emulsification and so? Yeah, that's, that's actually a beautiful question. I like that question. Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, uh, so CARES, you know, there is a role for Synergy in all these uh, procedures. So you can uh, do CARES, bring it, bring your, uh, you know, refractive error to very good acceptable levels. And then whatever is the re remaining residual, you could, uh, you know, uh, do it either with an intact, sorry, either with a, a fake IOL or a, a, I don't really like clearance extraction too much. But yes, if you do that, you can do that. Uh, you could also you uh, combine it possibly with uh, some amount of topograided PRK to get some more regularization if you want. So there, there is role for synergy uh, among all these techniques. And if you already have experience with some of these techniques, yes, you could combine them. So if you combine, for instance, which is also possible with intacts and uh, or uh, synthetic segments and uh, you know topograded PRK like the Athens protocol and all those things, you could always decrease the amount, the, the maximum amount of uh, sphere and cylinder using uh, ICRS, either CARES or synth uh, synthetic ones. And then whatever, so the amount of tissue that you need to remove now uh, decreases even further. You may not even have to go to the 50 microns to be able to get better reg uh, regularization. Yes, yes, Leon. Uh, about the treatment of PMD, I'd like just to, to comment about the, the results of uh, syntactic intrastromal cornering segments. Uh, we have to dif differentiate uh, there a real PMD where you usually have a thinning in an optical zone of eight millimeters and a PMD-like. Most cases of uh, crab claw configuration are really, are actually uh, okay. PMD-like and not real PMD. And the behavior is completely different because one is the, the, the cartoconus that usually occurs in the teenagers, younger, and usually the real PMD, we see progression, progression even in adults. So in this case, the results are much worse in the real PMD compared with the PMD-like, Curtoconus PMD-like. Mm. The rings can be implanted, yes, but the results are limited. Yeah, what, where do you, uh, Dr. Leonardo, where would you implant a single segment inferiorly when you do in, uh, synthetic ones for PMD? Uh, I, I always uh, use uh, uh, my point of reference is the steepest axis that usually is at 180 degrees. So it, it, the ring is as a smile inferiorly in a five millimeters optical zone, usually the, the corner is, is very thin, very fairly. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you are not treating the, the area of the disease, but you are treating an adjacent area uh, to induce an effect uh, that it's reasonable. I, I don't think it's the best indication for rings. As, as I said, I haven't done CARES in PMD. Uh, do you think that it would make more sense implanting if, if, you, if someone wants to do CARES in PMD? Uh, do you think it would make more sense implanting it at a smaller zone or implanting it in the area of thickness, thinner, thinnest, in the thinnest area? I think that uh, the rings, as, an, an, a, a, uh, as an, a, procedure of, a procedure of addition of tissue, uh, especially when you are using a, 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 a not synthetic tissue as your as kinds as your technique i would try to if uh, i'll try to 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 use your technique uh in these cases in in the thin in the thinnest point of the cornea to okay. reinforce the corner at that point mm -hmm. what do you think susan I think so too. I think so too. I, I haven't done it, so I, I, I really cannot say, but I think what you say makes sense. Thinnest point, thinnest area would probably be better. Yes, be because the real PMD is very uncommon. It's not, it's not something that you see every day uh, as Kertikonos. Yeah. The, the, the uh, PMD like is quite common, but the real PMD is not. Yeah, I agree. I agree. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suzanne and Dr. Leonardo. Now, uh, please, Dr. Suzanne, uh, switch off the uh, sharing. Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. And to allow Dr. Leonardo to start. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Don't, don't mention. The questions are non-stopic. Are non 
So we will go to Leonardo presentation and then complete the discussion later. Okay. 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 I'll share my screen. Yes, please. Uh, well, I'll talk about how to improve clinical outcomes using intrastromal coronary ring segments. First of all, I'd like to thank again, Dr. Rassan, for this kind of invitation. And I, I'd like to share with you some pearls. Um, I have been, uh, I, I think it's, uh, are useful for, our, to get good clinical outcomes. First of all, the indication, you have to select the patient, uh, properly. Today, there is no, almost no case, Keptokonos case, then you cannot implant the rings. You can implant rings in very mild case and in an advanced case as well. But before, to, before implanting the rings, you have to treat aggressively uh, uh, all conditions associated, usually dry eye, allergy. We know that patients with allergy uh, left and treated before the rings uh, usually have much more risk of uh, extrusion, rotation, and migration of the segments. Uh, we, we need to know to master and understand the ring selection. Uh, there are a very, uh, uh, avail uh, several available uh, rings, uh, uh, and you need to know to understand the mechanism of action in order to not depend, not rely on uh, online calculators. Surgical technique, always uh, when possible, we should use Fento, but in some cases, patients cannot afford Fento and you need to know, you need to master manual technique. You can get very good results with manual technique as well. So if, not, if Fento is not feasible, go manually. And as in any surgical procedure, you need to be able to solve potential postoperative complications. You need to, if you need to know how to put the ring in, you need to know how to take it out and to solve potential complications. And especially address patient expectations. Uh, some patients come to us with cardioconus expecting, expecting a refractive surgery result of rings. That's completely uh, uh, not uh, untrue. So we have to have a chair time of, with these patients and to talk to them that they, they have a disease and you are going to treat the disease. There is a residual refractive error that will be, that will be addressed posteriorly with glasses, contact lenses, fake IOL, or any other uh, option or procedure. But when you should implant uh, rings? Given a case of keratoconus, when you should indicate? In case of unsatisfactory corrected vision acuity with glasses and or contact lenses, patients that usually have good visual acuity with lenses but is becoming uh, progressive intolerant to contact lenses, clinical and topographic evidence of disease evolution. Um, some may, may, may tell me, oh, this is indication for cross link. I agree, but in case of uh, bad visual acuity, you have to improve the deformity first and then go to cross-linking. To reduce corneal asymmetry and prepare for optical treatment. Prepare for optical treatment means uh, a high myo patient that is looking for uh, fake IOL implantation, uh, you should always treat the keratoconus first, or a patient with cat cataract and keratoconus you should treat the, the cornea first and then go for cataract surgery. So today it can be implanted in almost any case of keratoconus. Uh, in more, in my case, for, for example, grade one and grade two, usually have a, usually have a better uncorrected visual acuity, but less gain in terms of lines of visual acuity. And in, more advanced cases, grade four, usually have a final worse uncorrected distance visual acuity, but more gain of lines of visual acuity. So any case of more advanced keratoconus, grade three or four, should go to rings before cross-linking. So you need to improve the deformity first 
and then go to cross-linking if needed. And I, I, why with needed? Because many patients implanted with rings remain stable without the need of additional cross-linking, especially, especially patients not too young, patients with mild catatonics. In terms of patient selection, we need always to assess the visual fu function uh, to know the uncorrected visual acuity, the corrected visual acuity, and to assess the potential of visual acuity gain with the uh, rings. And the pinhole is very useful for that. So the pinhole can, can measure um, the gain of the, of, in terms of line of vision with the rings and a proper ectasia classification. And in case uh, you have an expected result, what do you need to check uh, with the rings? There is an A, B, C, D of uh, unexpected results. First, A, asymmetry, B, biomechanics, C, centralization, and deep depth. Asymmetry. Asymmetry can be the corner itself, and this will uh, drive you uh, through the ring selection. So if there is a, a symmetry of the cornea, you should uh, plan for asymmetric segments. And asymmetry can be related, if, uh, of the, related to the implanted segments. So asymmetric segments, I mean, in terms of uh, wrong implanted segments, uh, will impair our surgical outcome. So this V pattern is quite common in keratoconus. So these asymmetric corneas require asymmetric segments. Always remember uh, of that. Uh, in this case of very symmetric keratoconus, if we implant a, a long arc segment as a 320, we will probably keep the symmetry because the flattening effect is all the same inside the area of the ring. So this may impair the, 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 the clinical result, the improvement of visual acuity. So in cases of asymmetry, you should, not, you should never implant long arc segments, as in this case too. And the other type of asymmetry, asymmetry is the asymmetry seen uh, with the manual technique. That's today with the, with the phantom second laser, we don't see this type of asymmetry anymore but it should always be avoided with the manual technique. The B stands for biomechanics. Biomechanics, the corner rigidity, it can be too stiff or too soft. Uh, we need to better understand it. I think that the Corbis from Oculus, I have no financial interest, but it will uh, help us a lot to better understand the biomechanics integrated with the intrasomal corner ring segments. And the next step, I think, uh, should be the integration of biomechanics in the nomogram of rings. Uh, that's not available um, at this time. This C stands for centralization. Uh, we need to know that the corneal should always be very coaxial to the microscope. And then we have to remember to uh, make the chin of patient up it's very common for the patient to be chin down, and this will impair the centralization of the ring. Uh, always mark the light reflex of the cornea on the cornea. And in case of fento, you can turn, change the tunnel location if needed to get the centralization, centralized. So this is a, a positioning. Always we need to remember to put the chin up to the microscope to be very coaxial to the corner. Uh, this is very important to keep a very centralized uh, reflex and always mark the light reflex on the corner. Our point of reference is the light reflex of the corner, not the center of the pupil. Uh, with the femtosecond laser, a most uh, device as the for example, the LDV, they allows us, uh, allows us to change the position, the position of the channels. So you can, so you can then um, 
adjust the position of your tunnels and to avoid uh, discentered tunnels. This is a very are extreme cases of very discentered segments that should never occur. So in this case, you should remove the segments, and reimplant the segments later. And the V stands for that. The, ring, the segments can be too superficial, too deep in mid-stroma. The ideal in terms of results, in terms of uh, long-term safety, should, should be 75 to 80% depth. Uh, here you see on the left side, a, mid, uh, a ring implant in mid stroma to superficial. Uh, it's not an adequate position, but the, as the corn is very thick, it's not impaired. Uh, there is no, almost no risk of extrusion. And on the right side here, we have a ring in a ideal position that should be 100 micro from, um, from the endothelium. Here's the opposite, a very, very deep implanted segment, uh, an almost predestined segment. Uh, there are two problems here. First, the almost complete lack of, um, of work of the ring. It will not work because it's not stromal, interstromal, almost not interstromal. And the risk of, uh, uh, of damage to endothelium. We know that the, the rings is very safe to endothelium, but if very deeply implanted, it can damage the endothelium, as you can see here in this case. On the left side, the, the, the very deeply implanted segment, and the, the right side, the normal corn. Here, a picture of two superficial segments. There is uh, damage of the corn epithelial. This ring should be removed. And here uh, on fluorescing, a very superficial segment. So in conclusion, the, the rings keep evolving. Uh, it, it's not a static uh, um, type of procedure. In the future, you may expect uh, artificial intelligence assisted nomogram, biomechanics integrated nomogram, and new ring designs. And the keys to successful outcomes are patient selection, ring selection, a very good surgical technique, and a very good post-operative management. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leonardo, for this guiding presentation about the basics uh, and the, 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 um, the stepping of the intercooling ring segment, uh, how, how to choose how to put uh, how to take the decision is so important uh, to put the base for the, for that work. So uh, uh, I think after setting of this base, we we have to raise this uh, the, the minds and the and the storm of the brains together with the, with the clinical cases. I think you told me that you have a cases for to discuss together. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Give us. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Okay, Dr. Susan, do you want to say any comment about anything from? Uh, I think uh, that was that was a very lovely teaching uh, session. I really enjoyed it. Uh, that A B C D uh, was was it really summed up everything so beautifully, and I think there was nothing that was missed about how to uh, you know get uh, good results and how to not forget anything. I like especially the way Leonardo showed uh, the positioning of the patient's head. You know the importance of marking the light reflex, not centering on the pupil, but rather making sure that you center on the. I, I think it was it was I really enjoyed Leonardo's presentation. Thank you so much, Leonardo. Thank, Thank you, you, Susan. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. It's very important to put the basics before going to the advanced uh, techniques of the, the, the issue, because uh, uh, it, it's very uh, crucial and and very very uh, principle, especially for the beginners, to know the, the, the basic steps how to how to do it perfectly. Uh, thank you, Leonardo. Thank you, Susan. 
I think go to Inaldo. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so thank you. Okay, Hosan, thank you. Well, this is a very, very simple case, uh, but I think we can learn a lot of from, from it. Uh, this is a 15-year-old uh, female. Uh, she came for a second opinion. Uh, it was indicated cross-linking for another doctor. And this patient has chronic ocular allergy. And another doctor indicated uh, rings for the left eye. The corrective visual acuity was 2025 on the right eye and 2080 on the left eye. This is the, uh, the topography, the gallery of this patient. You see here uh, eight diopters of topographic astigmatism, a uh, uh, grade three carcinomas. And as this patient had a bad corrected visual acuity, uh, despite of being very young, uh, my, my, my plan for her uh, would be implant the ring first and then maybe cross-link after. So the plan here were, uh, was two segments, 160 arc length, five millimeters, 200 micro, and another one the same. The incision at the steepest axis, which is 70 degrees. Okay, the surgery was done uh, with the manual technique. The visual could improve uh, to 2030 with minus six, but on this little lamp, we saw this picture. Um, there was uh, epithelial in growth, this whitish uh, spots on the tip of the ring, of the of, on the nasal segment are epithelial that uh, entered, had entered through the tunnel to the ring. So there was a migration of segment here. And what's the plan here? Um, what, watch and follow. Should we reoperate re this patient with repositioning, explantation or exchange, retinalization, suture, glue? Uh, should we discuss before or should I go, Hassan? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Shuzen, uh, I thank you. Uh, you want to answer? What's the plan, um, in your opinion? So, uh, if I am right, uh, the visual improvement was not uh, affected by the, uh, uh, by the, mi the migration happened uh, later, right, with time. Leonardo? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so the topo, if the topography is not uh, changed too much and if the patient's visual acuity is still okay, uh, I would probably observe to see if that epithelial growth is increasing with time uh, because some of them do subside on their own. Uh, if it seems to be progressing and uh, if that seems to be also causing some amount of you know, uh, topographic changes or uh, leading on to a overlying stromal necrosis or something like that, then I would uh, consider uh, repositioning or not repositioning actually uh, going in and removing that, uh, trying to scrape up that epithelium, maybe YAG laser, something that has been, uh, uh, you know, described for epithelium growth. I have not tried it again, but uh, maybe this is one place where you could try it as it's more difficult to remove epithelium growth from a channel as opposed to a LASIK flap where you can just lift up the flap and remove it. So uh, I think as of now, I, I would probably observe, I don't know what Leonardo did. <laughs> okay, uh, Jose. Yeah. How about you? <clears throat> I, I, I will. I will think about the uh, the expected results if I do anything more. Uh, the the inter the intracorneal ring signal is still inside the tunnel, right? The epithelial, yes. the epithelial migration it, inside the tunnel it it, it, it does not. Uh, uh, it does not go for the center to, to make a problem for the visual access. So if there is no exposure, if there is no extrusion, and I don't think any more benefits from, uh, from any intervention. I will wait uh, for that patient. I will give so, a time. I will follow up. One, one more thing I'd like to add is, of course, uh, before that you stain with fluorescein and see if there's a a channel that can be made out, a tunnel which can be made out, which is active, which shows that there's still a fistula through which epithelium is likely to keep continuing to grow in. 
and if that is there then uh, you could of course uh, close that and uh, try to also scrape off some uh, epithelium and possibly put a suture and glue that that's another option that could be done if you think that uh, if there's clear evidence of it being an active epithelial in growth yeah so the, when exactly at the point um, I thought about uh, just uh, watch and follow this patient uh, this was my first uh, uh, thought like me uh, but uh, as the patient was not so happy with the result there, there was a very thin line of staining with the fluorescing. I thought it was better to, uh, uh, to reoperate this patient. Uh, if it was not that, I would follow this patient. Uh, but I show what, what was done. Yeah. So, uh, I always, uh, in these cases, I always prefer to, to remove and to put a new reg, a new segment. Uh, if you consider that you are working with a, 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 a synthetic device, I do not, I would not like to implant the same, implant the same ring again. So I remove it. Uh, I make a new tunnel. Actually, just extend the tunnel. It could be a little bit short, and this could um, uh, have influenced in the migration. So I extended a little bit more, and I washed the tunnel very thoroughly with moxifloxacin, trying to uh, to clean all the all debris of epithelium and also to avoid any future infection because it was a reoperation. And implanted uh, another segment, a new one. And I could here uh, had put some glue or even suture, but I prefer to ask the patient to, to not touch your eye and be very, very, uh, Avoid to touch your, your eye. And it was good. The, the result was good. And the visual improved a lot. I really did not expect this improvement in refraction and, the, and best corrected visual acuity. So uh, I, unfortunately, I have, I have no picture of, of long-term pictures of this patient, but I saw this patient just two months ago. And it was stable for one year. So this is the post-op topography. And that's it. Uh, it shows that, that the ring is a technique that it's reversible, readjustable. I think this is one of the beauties of this technique. And it always, almost always, gives you the chance to adjust uh, a next satisfactory result. Okay. I think that was a very interesting case, you know. I like the. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Susan. A, a simple case, right? But I think you, you can illustrate. Actually, this is quite uncommon nowadays with the femtosecond laser, because with the manual technique, usually have the the channels are not that narrow uh, as we get with fento. So you usually have uh, larger channels, so there is um, a higher risk of migration. But with Pento, is very, very uncommon. I think uh, this is one thing where I would say that CAS has an advantage over uh, uh, synthetic segments because synthetic is plastic, so it can always move. There's nothing binding it in place. Whereas with CAS, yeah. it's like a elastic flap. It, it, you know, it gets attached and it stays there, and there's this capillary action, and then slowly it just gets integrated with the cornea. And so the chances of this migration is uh, really uh, decreased with these segments. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So then, uh, can I can I share with uh, just two or three cases to discuss about the intercornea ring segments and the the, the different decisions? Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. The the case one. 
she was a 38-year-old female, past the history of LASIK surgery bilaterally two years ago by me. The preoperative data was very well, and she was a very good candidate for refractive surgery. On the last visit, was, uh, which was uh, one year ago, the unaided visual equity was 6-6 OU. So I was happy and cheerful. Then on this time, the, on the, the, the last and the second presentation on uh, the July 2019, uh, she was panic when with depression and the rapid drop of visual acuity, the unaided visual acuity was 160. Really was 160 in the right eye and 360 in the left eye. The best corrected was uh, 260 and 660 in the left eye. So it was a terrible moment. The refraction on the autorefractometer, which was so surprising and depressing and depressive, was minus eight sphere, minus nine cylinder on this axis in the right eye, minus four sphere and minus five cylinder uh, on this axis in the left eye, uh, even under uh, after cycloplegic, uh, the after. Uh, the, uh, also with the cyclovagic refraction was the same. The normal interocular pressure on the fundi, very minimal keepies on the back of cornea, and the old, uh, otherwise the old corneas were clear. So it's, it's so, it was very hard moment, and I was asking who switched off the, the room light. Mm -hmm. I sent, uh, this is the, big, the first state line picture for her eyes, right and left, almost clear. There's no signs uh, which could lead me to diagnosis of this case, but so the, the, the only suspected diagnosis in this case is uh, the disaster, which is post lasik ectegia. This is the first thing to, uh, to pick up or to think about. This was her pentacam. On that day, as you see, the the key one forty nine, the key to forty nine, but the key max was fifty six point nine, which is which was so strange. Uh, what do you think about this pentacam? And the, the, this is the right eye, and I can show to the 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 left eye. This is the left eye. Yes, what do you think about? Susan, Leonardo. Uh, what, what is myopic or hyperopic LASIK? No, myopic LASIK for minus two sphere, minus 1.5 cylinder in both eyes. Okay. The cornea is too thick, no? Yeah. The cornea was uh, thick before. Or it was thicker, thicker than that. Seventh. 674 in the center was thicker than that. Pre up. What do you think? What, I what think you, maybe. What do you think that if I, if I found the cornea which is thicker than 650 or 70 or 700 even, I would do a laser for, for her? It's a good, uh, uh, it's a good uh, notice, Leonardo. It's a good note about the thickness. Yeah. I, <clears throat> uh, I, I would get an anterior segment OCT. Uh, maybe have, this patient may have something bef uh, below the flap or on the interface because it seems that there is an ectasian in a very thick cornea. Yeah. You, you don't, you don't uh, support the opinion of ectasia, right? Or, or, or you are with this is, this is the first state lamp for the cornea. Um, the, you said that the pressure was normal? Yeah. In drop pressure? Yeah, completely normal. Well, 13 millimeter mercury in both eyes. And did you, do you have an anti... Because sometimes you can have, uh, you know, fluid interface syndrome because of pressure, exactly. increased pressure. And uh, the pressure may still appear to be falsely normal uh, because that soft cushioning of the fluid in between doesn't give you a 
the actual pressure readings. So that's that's again something yeah. that could be thought of. But but uh, I cannot. And also, uh, of course, with such high uh, thick uh, with such thick corneas, you always uh, look at the specular count as well. But I'm not sure if specular <clears throat> would cause such a localized uh, elevation. You know, it would more be more generalized. Okay, but I couldn't I co I couldn't detect the inter the uh, the uh, the inter flap the fluid. I ca I can not detect it with the seat lamp, even in this with high magnification. <laughs> You can sometimes detect it if you look for it very carefully, but I think OCT is a better way to look for it. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know that when I send here for the pentacam, the interpreter, uh, I, don't, I don't know wh why and how to, to say that, she, get, she gave me the conclusion as a post TJ. She was shocking me more. But when I checked, the thickness, I shifted my mind and, and the thought in another thing. <clears throat> so uh, I, I think it's somewhat tricky case because it is after LASIK. The first thing to, to think about is the post-LASIK tegia, but actually she's not. Let, let's complete. The thinnest location here is 539, but it's, it's vertically, uh, sorry, it's horizontally deviated. It's up. It's not to the inferior side of the cornea, it's, it's up. It's away from the cone. The thinnest location is away from the cone, and, 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 and we have to notice that. And this is the, the uh, left eye the same. So, this is the anterior segment OCT and speaker microscopy for her. Does it, help, does it help us in something? There is nothing in the in the bed, in the in the uh, under the flap. The flap is intimately attached to the bed. There is no fluid interface. Is there any uh, was there any epithelial thickening? Uh, you know, which could again be causing this. An epithelial map may also be helpful in such a situation where if you're having actually we don't thickening, have that would be a yeah, it's, it's a good idea too, and we have Dr. Uh, Yasser Rifai from Morocco. Uh, he's, he's one of the pioneers in the, the epithelial mapping, uh, uh, studying, and and uh, speaking about it everywhere. Dr. Yasser Rifai, do you hear us? But actually, we the we don't have any epithelial mapper to 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 get a map. But let's complete until we get another idea. Treatment I dealt, I have dealt with it as a as a, as um, the 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 status of the corneal edema. So I give her the normal sealant, five percent prednisolone, and the corpus lubricants, and then followed her up. Then she came me one week more by this image, by this uh, clinical changes in the cornea. What do you think about this now? It, it, clinically, it seems to me to be a disiform keratitis, or paddock. Yeah, yeah, perfect. But yeah. It's, it's disiform keratitis, so there is a central corneal edema in this, uh, in this visit after just one week or 10 days after the first presentation and, and after the initial treatment, which I have started. Uh, so, central edema by this. Uh, I shifted the mind to the autoimmune disease or to the, the viral keratitis. I started the oral cyclovir, the topical gancyclovir, and fluoromethylone in very small dose and immunomodulator. After 10 days, no response. So I have turned, it, turned this patient to aggressive autoimmune therapy under supervision of an autoimmune disease consultant with a systemic injectable methotrexate, the oral prednisone, under his supervision, and topical hydrocortisone, I ointed five times per day, and the primadine uh, eye drops every 12 hours, twice daily, after two weeks from, from this 
uh, aggressive treatment, I found a very, very marvelous improvement. I will start with the Pentacam. If you compare the KMAX here, it's 54, plus 60 some in the right eye, before the thickness uh, uh, went down to 510. It was beyond 600 and 700. So this is the left eye, the, the right eye, before and after. Notice here, the key max 54, it was 56.9 after two weeks of treatments. And this is the left eye before and after. The key max here is 45.8 and it was 51.3. Three weeks more uh, under my and uh, his treatment showed more improvement in the pentacam and also in the, in the in the clinical findings in the visual acuity and the and, and, and his cornea and and the hair cornea sorry so the cornea went back to the clear uh, status and the clear uh, center with the visual acuity of 612 and 69 612 in the right eye and 69 with very minimal uh, with very minimal spherical error and almost a clear cornea view, she actually restored her vision and mode wellness to and me as well. Thank you very much for. <laughs> I, I think I think I, I think it's very deceiving case. Yes. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. Any comment about it? No, I think it was uh, <laughs> it was a very interesting case because there was uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, the, the, it could have been due to so many reasons and you know you have to exclude so many things and the way the patient uh, progressed you know you thought of viral keratitis and then you thought of uh, autoimmune and she you know really responded well to that kind of treatment uh, you know shows the importance of keeping your options open and keeping on thinking collaterally about what else can be. The cause it was bilateral, so I think you did very well, Doctor Hassan, because otherwise she could have had uh, bilateral loss of uh, severe vision. So bilateral severe loss of vision. So that was a case really well managed. Congratulations. Okay, thank you. But uh, actually, the only misleading, the, the first misleading point that she is after LASIK. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was a confounding factor. You know this. This was a confounding factor. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But exactly, you yes. managed it very well because, at, at, as it was bilateral, and la the LASIK was bilateral, yeah. you always would link one thing to another. Uh, one thing I think you can help us in this case of uh, uh, keratopathy of keratopathies of uh, of uncertain diagnosis is the PCR of awake equals. It's very helpful. The PCR. Um, of, of aqueous. You draw yeah. Yeah. Point 0.1, point 0.2 of aqueous and uh, send to a search of uh, herpes virus, CMV, and all this uh, virus that could cause these keratopathies. Yes. This may help. Yeah. yeah. OK. OK. Did you? Yeah. Do any serology or anything for this patient? Excuse or what me? was the uh, rheumatoid? What was the. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. We, we, we have asked for the old lab diagnosis for her, but uh, it, she was diagnosed uh, finally as zero negative autoimmune disease. There's, not, there's nothing positive, just the ESR. The sedimentation okay. rate was high, which is, which is general, not specific to anything. But, uh, uh, and like, she did not have any other systemic features of any no, autoimmune she disease. Has, she has systemic. Uh, it appeared she, she had uh, one week after presentation a lot of skin, skin lesions. Skin lesions and some myofibromatosis uh, and some myalgia too. So uh, I turned her, I, I, um, I sent her to uh, uh, an uh, uh, rheumatologist. Uh, to, to manage to diagnose and to help me this, in the systemic treatment because I don't I, I cannot control I cannot prescribe her the methotrexate 
and the systemic therapy uh, in, in, in a good way. Right, right, yeah. Okay, the, let's go to the second case. This case with this uh, pentacam, she's 28 uh, year old female with this pentacam. She, she came to my clinic uh, for the second opinion uh, for the, the uh, visual defect. And she was diagnosed by uh, the first uh, surgeon and the first uh, ophthalmologist as a cryoconus. And she, he, is, he was preparing her for the cross-linking together with the intercorneal ring segment implantation. But uh, I conflicted with him in this diagnosis because I, I, I think the pentacam is, is not uh, going to the, the diagnosis of cryoconus. Despite, despite of the steep cornea. But there's here a superior steepening. The, the, the whole cornea is steep, but there is superior steepening more than inferior. And both are far away from, from the normal range. So what could you think about this case? Complete the, the clinical data about her. And then, back, and then back again to the pentacam. This is the left eye, the same, like the right eye. And this is the fourth state lamp picture for her eyes, the right and left. Yeah, the, the refraction was minus one sphere and minus eight cylinder. In the right eye and in the left one, minus one and minus six cylinder, the unaided visual acuity was less than 360. The best corrected was 624 in the right and 618 in the left eye. The intraocular pressure and the fundus was normal with clear lenses uh, too. So let's back to the pentacam. What do you think? Is there some... Uh peripheral degeneration or something that's happening in this patient? Uh, there is nothing, there is no history of, of any uh, disease, any eye disease of any uh, uh, problems could, could On happen. clinical examination? Excuse me? On clinical examination? Yeah, in clinical examination, there is nothing. The, the, all, the whole eye is completely normal. Just the this cornea, just this cornea, so, sorry, just the this cornea, white shadows all over the periphery and the mid peripheral parts of the cornea. How old is this patient? How, she, she, she is 28. Sorry? 20 to 8. 28? Yeah. You said she's 28 years old? Yes. Okay. And she's married and, 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 and has a lot of children. Mm. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Yasser. Dr. Yasser Rafai is joining us now. Unmute yourself. Dr. Yasser uh, Rafai is a uh, cornea. Conus and the effective consultant from Morocco. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Turkechi, Dr. Susan, for your presentations. It was very great, very great. And Dr. Hassan for the invitation. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, my, my dear. Share us, please, share us in the diagnosis of this case and management. Can we see, please, the Pentacam? This is right eye and the left eye. Next location. Minus. When, when, we, when we look at the thinnest location, we will find G, uh, that the, this cornea is so thin, 363. But, but to, when, when we look at the Y coordinate, we will find it as plus 2.32, which is so far from the center of the cornea. 
and it's a way end up. So mm -hmm. I will, I will, I will consider it as an insignificant. Yes. Is there any uh, new vascularization in the in the in the no, cornea? Look, look again. Look again to this picture. There is whitish shadow around, yes. like, the, like that of the arca senilis, mm -hmm. but it's extending from the periphery of this of the cornea toward the center, uh, occupying all the peripheral part and the mid peripheral parts of the cornea. So the, the thinning is here. And she is not diplomatic. Is it a, uh, like I asked earlier, also Terrians or something? I, I, I thought in that. Terrian margin degeneration, but there is no history of vascularization or redness or inflammation of anything. I, I cannot trust all the time the, the, the patient's history, uh, but uh, we, we have to respect until proved otherwise. Mm. I'm I'm not in telling nothing because I know the this yeah. case for So I prefer yeah. not to tell anything. <laughs> Please keep the secret. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's not secret. We will we will uh, look at the the prefer part of the cornea. We will find it behaving. Embryotoxone. Like, excuse me. It's not uh, embryotoxone. Embryotoxone. Um, it's like uh, it's, it's the white thing in the yeah arca, arca similis. yes in French <laughs> I like arca in, in English yes yeah so yeah. maybe it, it, it's it's uh, it's giving the 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 thinnest uh, the thinning in the periphery yeah. and it's making the distortion of the cornea and the steepest uh, the steepening in this in maybe the 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 superior parts of the cornea. Yeah. I think it is a diagnosis because there is no problem of elevations. Yeah, okay. And uh, Dr. Yasser has uh, the MS39, so he can, uh, he can get the epithelial mapping for this case. What do you think if you, if you uh, get epithelial mapping for this case? Yes. What do you think? What do you think to find? Um, so if, the, if there is a thinning in the, in the superior part of the cornea, if there is a thinning, it means that uh, there is a protrusion here. And, yeah, okay. um, if, if, we if, if we find a, thin a thinning, if we feel a thinning on the center of the cornea, we will be worried about. We will consider it as a coronus or some ectetic uh, uh, conditions, right? Uh, not sure, because the, the, because the steepening is very high and the, uh, this this great steepening with normal elevation it's not to seem to be uh, keratoconus. Yeah. I don't think so. Susan? No, it's definitely not keratoconus for sure, but uh, mm, just go back to the right eye uh, pentacam again. I'm sorry. Mm, yeah, fine, fine. Yeah, so this is this is some kind of an irregular pattern which is either caused by some Maybe the region, the region like that, I can think of, of some peripheral uh, degenerative diseases of the cornea. Yeah, if, if there is no posterior, high posterior elevations, and also the pachymetry map is, is quite satisfying in the center part, but the thinning is present in the anterior, sorry, in the in the up peripheral part. So I have a question. Yes. How is the the conjunctiva in the the tars tarsal conjunctiva? Very quiet, very quiet. I search for uh, atopic disease or very necrotic conjunctivitis. So this patient may be eye rubber. Uh, I thought uh, I thought about that, but there is no, there is no sign of allergy. But uh, I think it's it's just a degenerative corneal degenerative disease affecting the the peripheral and the mid peripheral part. So the this diameter of seven point five millimeter of the cornea is affected by it. Uh, then, so we are together agreeing about the diagnosis. It's not cracconus. Yes. This this patient is, is seeking for refractive surgery. She she doesn't uh, she doesn't wear the glasses more. Uh, can you do a refractive surgery for her? No, I wouldn't. Yeah, she, she cannot wear. The glasses, and she she can she cannot wear to the, the the also the contact lenses because 
socially uh, is uh, it's unsuitable for her. Her ocular surface is completely normal. Excuse me. Is her ocular surface normal? Yes. The slit lamp examination. There is no scar, no any anything, no haziness. I couldn't. Uh, I I don't have a video for that. But about the images, can you can you find anything in this images? I, I think if you if you if you um, if you look at the the superior part, you will find be, just to be just to beside the slit line, the slit line of the lamp. You will find that there is a whitish shadow going to the center. So maybe there is faint. So uh, maybe uh, uh, extending with very faint opacity in the center, which makes uh, her pentacam uh, uh, steep like that. Uh, I think it's time to break the suspense, Dr. Hossam. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make you alert. I think in, in this case, uh, OCT is very valuable because we, we will have we will do uh, some high scans on the cornea to see if there is anything inside the not uh, that cannot uh, see in slit lamp. Maybe yeah. we'll find some opacities or something. Yeah. Okay, but why not to do a refractive surgery for her because of thickness or because of surface? If you are convinced about the surface and thickness. Why? Why are you scared from uh, doing a refractive surgery for such patient? I think she's got a very irregular, uh, you know, uh, uh, map. So for that kind of patient, I don't think they're going to do well with refractive surgery. And second thing is, without actually coming to a diagnosis, I wouldn't uh, want to go in for refractive surgery. So. Uh, probably uh, investigate her some more and find out what it is. I'm uh, still not sure what you're going to come to the diagnosis at. Uh, I yeah. mean, uh, unless, uh, I, and I don't think it is keratoconus. That definitely seems to be out, but other things still have to be ruled out. And if she really wants to uh, keratoconal degeneration, yeah, that's something that I was thinking of also. Is that what it was? Uh, yes, it's preferred coronary degeneration, but I... Um... I suppose to, to put the name T T C D Tyrion uh, T M D Tyrion margin degeneration if there is a history of a brightness or severe vascularization in the cornea. Uh, I think the the vascularization the preferred vascularization is is um, is a strict sign to the Tyrion margin degeneration. Should be preceded by vascularization and congestion of the preferred part of the cornea. Yeah. You should you should have a vascularization in terrains. and you're saying this patient did not have it all because that's yeah. what you said when I asked you. Yeah. Okay, my, my my opinion in this case may be shown this in this photo, in this photo of this thin old man. <clears throat> this head is a, is a with normal size, but in relation to the body, it's it's a very big head, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this cornea may behave like the the uh, the cornea after hyperbic correction. There is mid peripheral thinning, so there is counteracting central thickening, uh, steepening. I mean, so there is peripheral degeneration with thinning, which makes the center of the cornea steep. Yes, uh, it's con convincible. Yes. Yes. So so. I, I can, I can, think. In the practice surgery for this patient, but I will follow the customized ablation procedures. Maybe PRK, uh, maybe topo guided or wave front guided. Even I can do flap. Really, uh, this is my opinion. I can do flap. Uh, I can uh, lift the flap for her, thin flap, and the ablation with customized. Uh, softwares because I, I, I don't I don't have a weakening I don't have a weak points in this patient just a regular I thought her, uh, spectacle corrected best best uh, corrected visual acuity with spectacles 24 uh, 624 in the right eye and left eye is 618 which is which was satisfying so satisfying for her because without without any correction 
she she could see just 360 mm -hmm. she was not uh, wanting to wear contact lenses uh, you no. know mini scleral or you know close kind of contact lenses now uh, because of the social socio economic or social uh, uh, situations she cannot wear any contact lens because she is a farmer mm -hmm. her housewife and the farmer she cannot withstand the uh, the care with the care with the contact lenses but uh, i think you are you you dis disagree with me yeah, I probably would prefer staying off the practice as you for her. I'm not sure what the others would say. I, I, I'm putting the points to check with the Pentacam and the patient. I, I correlate the Pentacam findings with the patient's clinical data. So we now find any clinical sign which can, which explain the abnormality in the Pentacam, I, I, can, I, I, I can skip it. I can skip it because it's explained by pathology, not ectesia, not the cronus, not peak cornea. So actually, I have done a uh, uh, femto uh, customized LASIK for this patient. Femto flap with customized ablation for her. And she, up till now, she is very, very happy with the vision because she, she got a vision with more than 612 bilaterally uh, after correction of the high order operation and this refraction. And I am still following her up for one year up till now. And I will let you know about the uh, the updates of her. I, I hope to complete. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, <clears throat> the last question to close for uh, uh, the late time um, at uh, India. Uh, if you, if you have a patient with cross linking, do you expect that the the intracorneal ring segment implantation will be hurt? Post cross linking? Yeah, post cross linking. One year post cross linking. No, it's it's still it, the actual surgical procedure is not difficult to yeah. perform. It's not difficult to perform, uh, but uh, if you look at uh, uh, theoretically the biomechanics of it, you're dealing with a slightly stiffer cornea, so the amount of effect that you get may proportionately be decreased as. Uh, Doing it in the reverse direction, where you do a cross uh, seg a segment first, followed by cross linking, or you know, sequential or, or simultaneous. But uh, the reverse order, you're dealing with a slightly stiffer cornea. If you re remember, in my presentation, I showed you an example of a girl who had undergone cares with cross linking simultaneously in one eye, and then one year later, she came back for uh, a she had cross linked her in the other eye also, but not put in cares because she she was not financially. Uh, uh, she did not have the money to go for cares in both eyes and one year later she came back to do a cares because she found no difference in the left eye and a lot of improvement in the right eye and uh, uh, we could not get her the same result that she got in the right eye in the right eye she improved to uh, 6 6 uncorrected in the left eye she came to uh, i don't remember now i think she was 6 12 uh, she was still very happy because that was significant improvement for her uh, but uh, it is just a you know a, a both both eyes of the same of the same patient, similar keratoconic pictures, but uh, the difference uh, was uh, seen post cross link cornea and pre cross link cornea. Dr. Leonardo, what would you say about that? Well, uh, as the cross linking acts in the anterior two thirds of the cornea and the ring is deeply implanted, um, I don't think any problem in implanting rings after cross link. However, as the cornea is stiffer, uh, we may expect less result than in a virgin cornea, but you can do it. Yeah. Uh, you also, do it you still get results. Pardon? You still do get results, but probably not as much yeah. as in a non-crossing patient. Exactly. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Fai. Okay. Do you, do you have any problems with the with the with the, with the intracorneal ring after uh, cross linking? It's muted. You have to unmute him. Uh, he's his uh, his mic is muted. Either yeah. Yeah. No, it's not muted again. Uh, I have. I don't know whether. Yeah, it's it's fine now. Okay. It's fine. Uh, are you hearing hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah okay. Yeah. No, no, I have uh, no problem with cross, with the with the rings after cross linking with the femto laser. 
Okay, yeah. but, but you may you may find a difficulty in some uh, primary, some uh, virgin virgin corneas. No, there's no difficulty. Okay, uh, so what what could be the the cause of difficulty? Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Are, are you seeing this video? Yes. Okay. Yes. This is primary case with no history of cross-linking. Uh, uh, while I am, was quoting 320 arc length uh, intercoordinate rank, I found a very, very uh, uh, difficult introduction or entering of this segment. So I tried to uh, dilate the tunnel, which is which was made with the femto laser by the manual uh, dilator. I'm trying. I had such to I had it. such problems like this problem when uh, when the cor the cornea is very steep in the inferior part, and sometimes when you are introducing the ring, uh, you are in an uh, in, in, in area where the cornea is very thin and um, it blocks. Uh, what I do in this case, I, I push with my, with my finger, I push the cornea to make the ring in, the, in her... In her uh, um, uh, the tongue, nearby? Yes. yes. Okay. The ring goes like this, and then I push with, with my finger to put it in the... To turn it. Okay. I have sometimes this problem. But I have tried all, all of that first. I dilated it again manually after femto laser. And put it, and put the the ring. I tried to push it, but no way. So I'm going again to dilate uh, and and make the tunnel wider and 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 uh, uh, smoother. But I will go f further this time. Yeah, okay, I will try to, to uh, fasten the video. I'm trying to get the other side, but it, it was blocked. I adore Which 320, a... Leonardo. I adore 320 arc length. Yes, the, the, there are some, some uh, yes. steps. Very careful. Uh, usually, when you use Fento, you, you usually try to make very narrow tunnels to improve the results. The only exception for that should be the 320, because there is a vector of force during the implantation. And if it is too narrow, it, it is difficult to implant it. So in this case, I tried to make a little bit uh, larger the the tunnels uh, apart the internal t the internal dissection in external yes. uh, to not have problems implanting uh, also I usually use the uh, uh, mark first on forceps uh, with my left hand uh, another one while inserting the ring with my right hand yeah to yeah. keep the tip going inside the tunnel yeah okay I'm doing that. Uh Please, uh, uh, you will see that now. I'm, I'm fixing the the, uh, the rank with the forceps, and then yeah, passing it. There is a very high resistance. Yeah. Um. Can I say something? Yeah, okay. Please. Uh, you know, when uh, with uh, femtosecond laser dissected channels, uh, like Leonardo also said, if they're tight channels, and if you're pushing a lot, sometimes what can happen is because you're pushing either with the manual dissector or with the segment, it can start leaving a false passage, which mm -hmm. means it loses the initial femtosecond laser channel and then it starts going into a different passage. Yeah. And then yes. once that happens, you know, you, you just cannot progress anymore. Yeah. Uh, and I had described a technique for handling this with intacts uh, way before when I used to be doing it. I think publication must have been 2010, 2011 or something. Uh, 
which is which i call as a turn around technique where uh, because now you have uh, the femtosecond channel somewhere here and your segment went somewhere else you cannot possibly go in this direction anymore so now you take out that segment and you come from the opposite direction which means from the other side and yeah. that that lip that was formed which prevents it from going any further is now flattened back when you come from the other side so yeah. if you approach if you turn it around stop go trying any more from this side but turn around and uh, put your segment from the other side the lip that was formed gets flattened out again and then you find that you can uh, push the segment in you know uh, into the right track into the right femtosecond laser jack track okay okay thank you thank you very much this is the, the other case in the same day but this case uh, with history of cross linking 2 years ago but with some deterioration so it's it was so easier so i asked the question about the, the after cross linking implantation it was so easier like like um uh, 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 putting the knife in the cake as we are seeing I think the, the tongue of it is okay here. Oh my god, the rock is here. Look, Leonardo, the, the, the way how to handle the, 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 uh, the segment. Pardon, Hassan? With the triangle. Pardon? With the triangle. Uh, forceps, then the other one to, to help fixation. Yes. It has to be a special forceps, otherwise we would not hold properly. Yeah. It's going very smoothly without any resistance. But but here we will start to change the, 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 the lever or the, the force, the direction of the force. And before the, 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 the last segment by the Senaski, put it in, in the hole and then push it all around. So I was astonished on that day. The primary case was so difficult than the case after cross linking. Uh, so so the, the, the last question to, um, to, to, to make it uh, more beneficial for the, the participants and the audiences uh, what about the, the selection of the segment arc length. Are you using two segments or one large one or, or according to the cone uh, diameter, the optical zone of the diameter and its position in the cornea? Okay, uh, starting with Dr. Susan. Uh, I think it's basically the cone and everything that uh, decides the spherical equivalent, the, the cylinder, the astigmatism. The position of the cone all these things would uh, dictate what kind of segments you use uh, i just wanted to also say that uh, if it's plastic it's almost more difficult because as you saw in the video you're pushing in one direction you're pushing it you're pushing it this way but your segment really needs to move that way so that getting that exact uh, you know application of force is always difficult with uh, synthetic segments with CARES, you could actually just push it in till there and then continue pushing it in uh, further. Or you could, uh, I have actually devised an instrument which is like a pigtail probe, which you can actually put it in tight to the CARES segment and just pull it out. But I've also done it without, with just, just pushing it through and going on pushing further, further and using a reverse sensky from the opposite side to pull it in. Um, you don't experience so much difficulty. Um, I... Uh, I, I like to do double segments. I, I would say rather that I've done double segments more frequently. I have done 360, 330 also, but somehow uh, I, I do much more of double segments as I, I, I guess any FERS segment uh, surgeon would be doing. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Leonardo? Are you asking about the nomogram or uh, could you yeah. repeat again? The, the nomogram uh, when, when you find when you find the cone optical zone of the cone in the center in the inferior part uh, uh, what do you use just one segment one small segment or two 
segments or one large segment? What do you prefer? Uh, I, I'm asking about the clinical experience, not the nomogram itself, because I, I, I have a problem some, some, sometimes with the nomogram. Uh, yes, uh, I, don't, I don't use a nomogram, but uh, usually in more, the more advanced keratoconus, the more tissue you have to implant. So for the mild keratoconus cases, usually a single segment, inferior and temporal is enough. Um, keratoconus grade two to three with high astigmatism, usually two segments. And the real advanced keratoconus grade four, a single 320 segment. Uh, this is a very um, superficial uh, way of thinking, but it is. I mean, the more advanced, the more tissue you have to implant to get more flattening effect. Yeah, okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, Dr. Rafael. Yes. So uh, I, I choose the, the rings, it all depends on a lot of parameters. The, the first parameters I'm looking for the high order abrasions. Well, uh, if there is a coma, if it is a decentrated cone, I will choose in one ring. If it is a central, row, uh, a central cone, I will use a, uh, a big ring to try to treat the high uh, spherical abrasion. Uh, for astigmatism, I put it in the second, uh, second level because I, I want to treat the high order abrasions that we cannot treat with glasses or with fake IOLs. So I try to treat in the first step, high, or, uh, high order abrasions. And if I can treat in the same time, the, the, the astigmatism I can do. If we have sometimes the axis of the, the topographic axis is, the, uh, is, uh, is perpendicular to, to the coma axis. So it is good. We treat both of them in, in, with one ring. But when I have to choose between astigmatism and coma, I prefer to treat coma if even if sometimes I induce more astigmatism and the visual acuity is better uh, after when we treat a high order ablation. This is my, uh, and I, I use other thing is uh, uh, in the evaluation of the patient, I use the uh, axial length of the eye because sometimes we don't know if the, the myopia or the high myopia is coming from, from the axial myopia or from the, 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 the cone itself. So yeah, if I found a, a, a high uh, excellent, I treated with ring, then with fake A1. Yeah, okay. So I think that's a very good point, Dr. Rafay made, that you have to look at the excellent also. But mm. sometimes we tend to attribute all the sphere to keratoconus, and that yeah. is not always the case. That is really not always the case. In fact, I had a very interesting case, a very, very advanced case where I did a dial. And uh, generally with the ALK, you know, if you put tight sutures and same size graft, you can decrease the sphere substantially. But postoperatively, I found that I didn't get much decrease in sphere at all. And it was all because of a very, very long globe. Yes. Okay, Dr. Susan, if you, if you remember the first question I have asked to you about the, the, the power of tension of the uh, centimeter crank and the, the cares, uh, I, I have a, a long uh, 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 clinical experience about the coating of one segment. 100, if, if the cone is inferior and small cone, when I put one ring segment of 160 ring uh, arc length, and it's the same, the same uh, uh, condition, the same cooling and same cone in other patients, when I put two segments, 160, in, all over the cone, and the put in the opposite, uh, uh, the opposite side of it, just 90 arc length, another segment, I found a very different and good results with the two segments. And instead of the cone, the same cone with the same refraction, the same astigmatism, but putting of two, th of two segments uh, gave, gave me a, a much better results about the, the flattening of the cornea and about the visual acuity improvement. So uh, I, I consider that, that there is a tension power for the synthetic segments uh, uh, after after these observations, uh, what do you think about? You know, two segments will always give you a decrease in uh, sphere more because you're actually pushing everything to the side and you're flattening the cone. So with two segments, your sphere sphere will in, uh, decrease more. A single segment is uh, more, uh, you know, aimed at like Dr. Ife said to decrease the coma aberrations, uh, things like that. 
cylinder cylinder specifically if you you want to target you can again use two segments and decrease the arc length so so that you are acting on a more localized axis so that's one way of targeting cylinder alone so uh, what you what kind of effect you want uh, you can kind of tailor it by you by changing the kind of or the degree of uh, arc length and all that and again dr like dr leonardo had mentioned in the beginning you can change this uh, optic zone again make yeah. it smaller you know to get a more pronounced effect so there are really lots of ways that you can you can try and change the kind of effect that you get okay what well, about the nomogram uh, uh, do you follow the nomogram about in, in the in the in the point of the visual acuity if there is a patient with visual acuity best corrected visual acuity less than 660 Would you go for intercornean segment, intercornean ring plantation? Less than six sixty. Yeah. Best. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I will, would. You will do. Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, but, but because of the nomogram uh, uh, denoting or stating that the, the vision beyond the six sixty or and below six sixty, it's not candid. This patient is not candid for the intercornean ring segments. So uh, uh, really, really, I don't believe in because. I, I have a lot of patients so far from 660, but with good corneal thickness. When I when I put and I'm respecting all the time the corneal thickness of the track, not the thinnest location. If 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 the thinnest location is away from the track of the ring, I consider that the corneal corneal thickness all over the track of the lens or the, or the tunnel is a, the thickness of judge. If it's more than 400 or 400 micrometer, I will put the intercornean ring. And I have found a lot of surprising cases. Uh, I, I, I cannot, I cannot forget a patient ten years ago from Libya came to me for for management of coronas. Uh, the, the the doctor, some 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 surgeons there in her country decided to cut plastic. The thickness was more than four hundred micrometer, uh, and the clear reading was fifty seven. But the vision was Less than 660. Following the nomogram, she was not candid. But I put the ring, and surprisingly, she could see 612 unaided. And I, I, I couldn't believe at that time. But I, I do it many times and found the same results after that. So I'm asking about the nomogram. Uh, uh, we, we have to respect the nomogram all the time. Leonardo. Absolutely no. Uh, actually, as as the ring is a much less invasive procedure than comparing with dog, I always push to try the ring before a dog. Uh, the ring itself does not impair a dog after the ring. We are working in different optical zones. So I have several very advanced keratoconus with very good results with the ring, and to. Uh, if the patient is too young to postpone the, the the transplantation, or even to not need the transplantation, the the dog. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I don't use the visual acuity as a contraindication or an indication for the ring. I used to evaluate the visual acuity, and but this is not a problem. I mean, you could use it in very advanced cases with very good results, especially the long arc segments. Uh, you are also Dr. Refine. Uh, so when I plan for uh, an intracranial ring, I study three visual acu uh, vi visual acuities. Yes. The first one is uncorrected visual acuity. The second one is corrected with glasses, and the third one is corrected with scleral lens. Yes. And with these three visual acuities, I can I can know if the patient have the the, the most if he, if he has a potential. A good potential visual acuity. If with the scleral lens he has uh, eight, uh, eight out of ten, and uh, with the glasses he have one out, one of out of ten, I will go for for rings. But if with scleral lens uh, the the visual acuity didn't increase, I don't do the surgery because it it give me the evaluation of how amount of the high order abrasion. So for every case, I do these three uh, visual acuities. And I decide if it, if I will go for rings or not. Okay, perfect. Uh, Very good point. Yeah. Yes, Leonardo. I think that uh, uh, perfect, Dr. Rifei. I think it's exactly this that the way to go. 
But I think that uh, besides the scleral lens, or maybe even easier than the scleral lens, is the equity with the pinhole. Yeah. Because uh, the vision with the pinhole, you suppress all the aberrations. So it, uh, with that vision, you can have uh, uh, the potential of vision with the rings. It is something uh, useful to do as well. Okay. I, I call the, so sorry, I call the scleral lens test is like a corneal abrometer and the pinhole is like a total abrometer. So it gives us, we, we should yeah. use both of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Very good points, very good guidance. Uh, we, we do a RGB contact lens trial for every single keratoconus patient. We, yeah. we always do that. It's a, it's a very useful thing to have also postoperatively in case your vision has not improved. You You come to know whether... It, it's the limiting factor was cornea or something else. So I completely agree with that. Uh, if the RGBs don't fit, uh, we sometimes do a Roske trial or a, a mini scleral trial and try to see what is the potential best corrected visual equity that the patient can get. I think that's important to know. Yeah, that's yeah. part of our routine protocol. Yeah, very, very good points to, to know about this uh, evaluation of the patients. And because Dr. Susan is really sleeping, I, I think you are sleeping now. <laughs> so I will. Be, <laughs> I will. It's, yeah, I, 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 think, I think it's uh, it's now uh, it's now two two a.m. in India. Two a.m. Three a.m. Three a.m. in India. Three a.m. Oh, I must I must leave. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, no, no, we, no, no. I'm sorry. So I will give you the last question. Uh, 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 when you have a patient with. Uh, High cylindrical error, even minus five cylinder, but can can uh, get can uh, can have a good very good vision six six with the glasses, and the other patient with lower or smaller cylindrical error even minus two, but the best corrected is less than six six maybe six twelve. Will you go for intracornial ring implantation for uh, the small error? And for the high error, even this patient with the spectacle can see 6-6. Six, six. Or w w will you advise this patient to stay on the spectacle without intracranial rank? Yeah. Uh, uh, my question is clear or to... Yeah, 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 I get what you're asking. Yes, absolutely. See, um, I would probably do uh, an ICRS on both of them, but I would probably push the patient whose vision was not improving uh, the, the minus two diopter cylinder. I would probably push that patient more. I would, uh, you know, ask them to tell them that the potential benefit for them is much higher. Now, that's not to say that the five diopter cylinder will not uh, improve, uh, you know, or will not benefit. That patient is also definitely going to benefit because five is a high power for a, a cylinder. So I, I yeah, provided that they are, uh, you know, both able to undergo it, I would push both of them to undergo it, but probably giving more importance to the one where the higher order aberrations are uh, probably giving having a greater role in the decreased visual acuity. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. Perfect. Uh, uh, Dr. Rafai was was uh, talking about the high order aberrations. So I, I I had two patients. One patient is is, is a lady, uh, twenty four years old with minus five cylinder and just minus one sphere. And she, with, with, with the spectacles, she could see six to six. Myself, on my, about myself, I advised her to do just cross-linking for the first presentation and stay on the glasses with no need for intercornering segments. Other patient was minus three sphere and minus two cylinder and the best corrected achieved the best corrected maximally 612 in the left eye. The right eye was 66 with, with no spherical error, uh, no cylindrical error. And both are conic. I advised the, the, the other patient to do intracornial ring segment in the left eye, followed by the cross linking one month after. I have done both cross linking in, 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 in the lady with a minus half cylinder, and she is still seeing 6-6 six, six with the glasses, and no way to remove the glasses. And the other one achieved 6-6 six, six after implantation of the intracornial ring for the just minus two cylinder in the left eye. Uh, uh, do you agree for, for this uh, plan, uh, plan and management? Yes, only I, 
I yeah. agree absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Because if the patient is happy with his glasses, no, no way to 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 uh, to do rings. Yeah. And the, the second patient, uh, even if she if she has or he has a small cylinder, but the problem is high order abrasion. So you have treated the high order abrasion with with the with your rings. And I I I absolutely agree with the with your attitude. Okay, thank you, Leonardo. I agree as well, yeah. but. About the case of uh, minus five of cylinder and 2020 vision, uh, my opinion is this patient probably have a, a regular bow tie astigmatism and no corticonus. In this case, you can implant the rings, but this is refractive surgery because the, the vision is 2020. Uh, usually, this patient, I, I have many of these patients, usually, they, they, they are very happy. Yes. But some of them can lose a line of visual, uh, of corrected visual acuity. So you have to be aware with these cases okay. because you can induce operations. About the case, Leonardo, she, she has inferior stiffening of more than two diopters between the superior and the inferior points. Uh, the, the, the Q reading in the superior point it was 45, uh, sorry, for, was 42, and the inferior point was. 47. So with, with posterior with very high posterior elevation in the corresponding point. So I have con I considered her as a cratconus, even early cratconus case, but still still having a good vision. Uh, not just astigmatism, because there there was asymmetrical bow tie, not, not not symmetrical one. With okay. posterior okay. With posterior elevation. After removing of the old uh, false uh, uh, negatives and positives, uh, after repetition of the of the of the of the, uh, of the pentacams for her. Well, if, if the patient yeah. uh, does not achieve twenty twenty, it's not happy with the vision. We can yeah. go. We, we can go with the rings, but if the patient is happy with the vision, there is no signs of evolution, yeah. and it's not a is a, a, a mild cartaconus, you can also just follow the patient. I think you can have both uh, options depending on age, evolution, patient satisfaction with uh, her own vision. You have to take all of this in, into consideration. Okay, but, but here, here you, will, you, will, uh, you will remember the point you talked about the expectation. This patient, if I go for uh, intracranial ring segment implantation for her, she may expect that this will correct the error and she will may, may remove she may remove her glasses, but she 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 can see well with the glasses. If I put a ring for her, she will expect a better vision without glasses. So well, I think this yeah. this is this, uh, this may be solved with a very good chair time. You can you can never promise uh, to, for the patient to be without glasses after ring, never. Yeah. So, but some patients forget that conversa conversation before the surgery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, yeah, and you have to stay with the, with the patient preoperatively uh, a very long and good time because you will not, uh, you will not sit with, with the patient after you. You cannot answer or, or to reply to the accusing questions of the patients after surgery. So you have to, to yeah. be careful, to be careful and to be patient with the patient before surgery. Uh, yes. th thank you very much. Thank you for all. Thank you for Dr. Sosa and Jacob, the, the, the international example of the genius lady. Uh, <laughs> and they support, they are supporting the time the woman, the woman in ophthalmology. Right? <laughs> and, 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 and in India, there is a society, women's Women, women in ophthalmology society, and and Bonnie Henderson in in USA established one uh, for for women in ophthalmology. Thank you for your time, and we are appreciating uh, that you are still uh, with us until this <laughs> so, so late so late time. Thank you for your uh, patience and for your presentation and sharing and discussion, and for your uh, great teaching. For, for all of us. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Tom. It was nice to be here. It was nice to meet you and Leonardo and also meet Dr. Refe.
Thank you. And I think it was a, a very interesting session. And uh, your cases were also very interesting as well. <laughs> thank you very much. It's, it's our pleasure and honor. Thank you, Leonardo. Thank you, Dr. Leonardo Turkiti from Brazil for your, uh, uh, your tricky uh, uh, stepping and, and the instructions about the basics and about the uh, controversies in the entrepreneurial segments and different cases. Thank you very much and hoping to see you in Brazil or in Egypt again. And we are waiting for Susan too and Dr. Rifai to join us someday after uh, recovery from pandemic coronavirus. Uh, Thank you, thank, you much, thank you. Thank you, my dear friend. Thank you, Dr. Rifai, for joining us. Thank you very much. And this is a you. very good discussion. Thank you. 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 Thank